Right. Good morning, everybody, and to our panelists and our guests in attendance for the special IRR press briefing on why President Ramaphosa should veto the Employment Equity Amendment Bill. My name is Chris Hutting. I'm the Deputy Head of Campaigns at the IRR. I will play a host and prompter and prodder for today's press briefing. So those of you in the audience, if you uh, don't ask seriously deep and grilling questions to Gabriel and Anthea, I'm going to have to fill in in that role as well. So please uh, give me less work to do this morning. The Employment Equity Amendment Bill and its implications will be discussed this morning by the RR's Head of Policy Research, Anthea, Dr. Anthea Jeffrey, and the RR's Head of Campaigns, Gabriel Krauser. They will examine the bill and its possible effects on the constitution, the economy, and race relations in South Africa. Once they are finished with their presentation, uh, we will have time for Q&A. So please make sure that you have those questions ready um, for, for our speakers uh, once, once they are finished. I will now hand over to Gabriel to get us going. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we are gathered here today uh, as, the, as the heading shows and the invite says to talk about uh, the Employment Equity Amendment Bill. Uh, we, I, we've abbreviated that just to the EEB because it is basically more aggressive BEE -E in many ways. Uh, but let me not uh, take it any further because really to begin unpacking this will be Dr. Anthea Jeffrey. Anthea, over to you. Thank you, Gabriel. And what I thought I'd like to do is to start just by explaining what the two key provisions of the bill are. So if we could just look at that slide. And the first, key clause will empower the Minister of, Lab of Employment and Labour, that's Tulang Muzi, after he's consulted relevant sectors to set numerical targets for designated employers. That means employers with 50 employees or more in specific e econ economic sectors across the economy. And he will also be able to set different targets for different occupational levels for different subsectors for what the bill describes as regions within sectors, which is a rather odd formulation, but may make it possible to take account of the different demographics in the Western Cape and KwaZulu Natal, or he can set different targets on a basis of any other relevant factors, which is very broad and very vague. Then the second key clause is that employers that fail to comply with the minister's targets or to justify this failure on reasonable grounds. So they'll have the onus of showing justification. They will be barred from contracting with the state. They won't get employment equity compliance certificates. And so they will not be able to tender for contracts with the government or carry out any work that the government needs to have done. And there are some immediate ramifications that I want to deal with briefly. And the first is simply this that the bill is clearly going to be focused primarily on the private sector, which according to the minister is covertly fighting the Employment Equity Act, even as it pays lip service to it. And what we will see is racial targets, which will be quotas in all but name, are likely to be based on what's already set out in the BEE codes of good practice. But those codes are of course not binding on business, they are voluntary. So business may now be expected and compelled under the EEB to reach targets of 60% black representation at senior management level, 75% at middle management, 88% at the junior level. And these targets are clearly based on the fact that black people make up 80% of the economically active population. In other words, all people between the ages of 15 and 64 who either work or want to do so. They're also based on the assumption that all these people are equally qualified for senior and top jobs. In fact, however, half are under the age of 25, and so they're too inexperienced for very senior posts. 35% are unemployed on the strict definition and even more on the expanded one. And sadly, many of them have never worked to so have really no experience of the workplace at all. And 95% lack the degrees which are often needed or advisable for senior jobs. So 
What we will also see, because the pool of people from which employers can appoint is very much smaller than the government assumes, that businesses that do comply are likely to lose skills and experience and competitive edge. This is what has happened in the public sector, as I will talk about further in due course. But the public sector, of course, is shielded by having tax revenues always at its disposal, and business is not. Businesses that fail to comply or to justify this will face maximum fines raising from 2% to 10% of annual turnover, which could put many firms under great financial pressure and could even bankrupt some. Uh, a fine of 10% of annual turnover the government was warned some years ago would be enough to bankrupt many firms because not that many have profit margins at that level. Firms critically will also be barred from state tenders which could destroy their revenue lines, resulting in liquidation and job losses. This is the point made by both Business Unity South Africa in that submission to Parliament, and also SAFCEC, which is the South African Forum of Civil Engineering Contractors, and which obviously hopes to do a lot of construction work for the government on its infrastructure program. The exclusion of many firms from being able to contract with the government will leave the field open for BEE tenderpreneurs, as SACP calls them, many of whom are likely to charge inflated prices to pay bribes to officials and politicians to secure those contracts and to help fund the ANC. The Zondo Commission has given examples of this in the first report that it released this year. I'm now going to hand over to Gabriel, who's going to talk about some of the longer term ramifications of these changes in terms of the economy, and is also going to provide an insight into what ordinary South Africans think about race based legislation and how much it helps them. So over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Anthea. Um, so I just want to start by looking backwards in order to be able to accurately or, or as best as possible look forwards. One of the interesting things to note is that uh, the, the, the split in income across race groups in South Africa has already changed substantially. This is often overlooked. Um, uh, just this week, I was in the Human Rights Commission making presentations about uh, race in South Africa and race relations. And before me, various panelists, some of whom were politicians, had repeatedly said things like, nothing has changed, uh, and spoke at length as if apartheid continued, um, but we know that's not the case. So uh, whereas, and the estimates in 1994 are difficult to um, uh, uh, reconcile, there are, uh, they, 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 the data wasn't um, quite as, as good as we'd like it to be, but whereas whites certainly earned a majority of income at that period, despite being a minority of the population, things have changed drastically. The 2006 number that you see there before you is almost a 50-50 split in income across uh, the race groups, white and black, where black is defined in, in the broad BEE terms. Um, and that data comes from Stats SA and the 2015 numbers there, which unfortunately is the latest that we have available. Um, is that uh, basically one third of income was going to whites and two thirds was going to black people. And uh, the, the trend here you can see is very clear. Uh, it's also unfortunate that we don't have more recent data. Um, there is reason to expect that more recent data would show that trend progressing even further. Uh, but we do know that South Africa is a country with uh, famously high levels of, of wealth inequality overall. So maybe we should try and drill into the top 10%, as it were. Uh, and this is what we did using StatsSA's data. And we saw that the uh, black top 10%, this is now in the sense of black African, as it's used um, in official nomenclature, is the largest segment as of 2015. This was corroborated by New World Wealth, an independent consulting firm which found that black dollar millionaires were overtaking white dollar millionaires at this point. Um, the white top 10% coming in in fourth place, uh, white monopoly capital, whatever that's supposed to mean, clearly not dominant. Uh, in second place, we see the black middle 50%. In third place, the white middle 50%. Um, two things to note here. Uh, 
are that the black bottom 40% are almost invisible in terms of the share of income that's taken in. Uh, and I think that does point to a serious problem. Uh, it points to the kind of problem that BEE purports to solve, but in fact that EEB is going to make even worse. Uh, we will get to that. Um, but this should give you a sense of things that I, th that I think is relatable to people's experience um, of, of visiting uh, the deluxe upper crust of South Africa, uh, but which is uh, uh, hard to reconcile with so many members of parliament and cabinet who say that nothing has changed uh, and that uh, as a matter of course, it remains the case that black people are poor and white people are rich. Um, here we've given a table and I just wanna go through very briefly the sense of how much things have changed from 2006 to 2015. And that's uh, after the really huge changes coming from, from the 80s and 90s. Uh, but if you look at these top 10% figures, there you've got the black top 10% at a quarter of all income, the white top 10% at 10% of all income, uh, the colored top 10% at 4.2% of income, the Indian or Asian top 10% as is qualified in the stats SA data, 1.9% of all income. And so if you add these three figures together, uh, black, colored, and Indian, which gives you the broad BEE sense of black, um, then you get to just about 30% versus just about 10%, uh, which gives the result that the top 10%, in the top 10%, we see um, in absolute terms, uh, black income uh, being a factor of three greater than white income. Now, that's not to say that per capita, there isn't still, it isn't still the case that white people earn more than black people. And so we have asked a randomly sampled uh, group of people. Uh, this is, these are our 2020 results. I think many people will already be familiar with this. Uh, we've gotten similar results through different surveys that have been commissioned by different independent pollsters. Um, they more or less come out the same. And uh, we find similar results in, in, in other polls uh, commissioned by other bodies, including Stats SA. Uh, but just to go through this, so I've showed you that there's been this huge shift in incomes in South Africa. Uh, and yet I've, and so that in absolute terms, uh, the, the black top 10% uh, is in the dominant position, uh, but per capita, there is still this inequality. Is EEB needed to solve that? Well, we asked with better, with just better education and more jobs, the president, the present inequalities between the races will steadily disappear. Do you agree with that statement? Do you disagree or do you neither agree nor disagree? Only 11.3% disagreed. And it's the disagrees you want to focus on because people who disagree that more jobs and better education will make this lingering inequality steadily disappear. Those are the people who, who must believe that for that reason, you need something like EEB to step in to make the, those inequalities disappear. It's a tiny minority who believe that. Uh, the super majority, three quarters basically, think that we just need better education and more jobs uh, to hit the target, uh, supposedly, that EEB is aiming for. Um, we sp specify basically asking the same question, but in a different way. Uh, what do you think is the best way to improve lives? And we see that uh, most people think more jobs and better education. Very similar result, almost three quarters. I think that's the best way to improve lives. And you can see, if you break that down by race, that uh, the, the numbers are fairly similar across races. What about more BEE, which is effectively what EEB is, taking BEE uh, as it's more or less being applied in the public sector and, and, and forcing that across the board. Very few people are into that as an idea. Uh, very few uh, into more land reform. You could maybe put those in a bucket together, um, and you see that the split across races um, is perhaps, uh, well, has, has some curious features, uh, but it's certainly not the case uh, that uh, overwhelmingly uh, black people want this and white people don't. In fact, uh, it's much more complicated than that, but the simple fact is that most people think, again, more jobs and better education is going to help much more than more BEE. We go forward to ask, well, who should be appointed to these jobs? And I think this is one of the most fascinating results that we keep getting consistently. If you ask only black people should be appointed for a long time or only black people until demographic representativity is achieved. Uh, 
you can put these two together and you're getting about 16%. Now, this is important because this is what EEB will mean for many businesses. If a business is in a position where it is not meeting the quota that's been set by Minister Turles and Facey, and, and that quota can, can uh, as Anthea said, be set by subsector, by, sub -re by region, um, in a way that for some businesses, really, it is very difficult for them to achieve this without sticking to an only black people until they've met this quota. They won't be able to hire anyone else till they meet the quota, lest they face massive fines and the inability to contract with government, which uh, spends about a third of GDP, if not more. Very few people think that's a good idea. Very few. 60% say that appointment should be based on merit with special training for the disadvantaged. For the disadvantaged, note. Uh, and 20% say on merit alone without such training. So if you add that together, it's 80% prefer merit and slightly less than 20% are, are looking for the kind of employment strategy that EEB is promoting. And again, if you look at the racial breakdown, you see that, it's, that the national breakdown is very similar to the black breakdown amongst black people. So the idea that there are sort of uh, two South Africans in the sense that all black people think one thing and all white people think another thing, that's, that's really inaccurate and not substantiated by any facts, uh, which I think is important. Okay, just in terms of training, we mentioned training there. Uh, we've got a series of questions which demonstrate that that special, you know, special training for the disadvantaged doesn't mean for black people. It means for people who are genuinely disadvantaged. Um, and, and combining that with this further question about are people really looking for BEE as a way to dig themselves out of poverty? Uh, or, or, is it, or is it something else, this merit-based, better education, more jobs uh, program? We asked, would tax-funded vouchers for education, healthcare, and housing help you to get ahead more effectively than uh, affirmative action or BEE policies? And uh, yes, overwhelmingly, almost three quarters of South Africans say yes. Tax-funded vouchers, which really put the deciding power in the hands of citizens and take it away from the current BEE program, that is much better than more BEE continuing affirmative action. Um, why do South Africans have this preference for merit? Given our history of apartheid and, and uh, uh, oppressive white supremacist government, um, well, I think the answer is because things have changed. 80% of South Africans say no to the following question. Have you personally experienced any form of racism in the, in the past five years? 80% say no. No racism in the past five years. That's unthinkable in 1976, 1986, 1992, but it's, it's the world we seem to live in in the, in the 2020s. We, we Again, we, we keep getting these kinds of results. And, and just for comparison, Stats SA in 2018, 2019 asked a similar question. They asked in the last two years, have you personally experienced any form of racial discrimination? And they had over 90% say no. So, you know, this is not just us. This is not just a pollster methodology thing. This is a, this is a real result. Of course, on the news, a lot of people say I experience racism every day. That's what it means to be black. But most people, including most black people, 80% disagree. Uh, whatever racism means, it's the kind of thing that most people are not experiencing. And I think that's why we're willing to embrace merit, because that's actually the lived experience of most South Africans, is to be treated meritocratically and to see the benefits of that. All of this talk of racism and colonialism, the kind of talk that has been coming out of cabinet to motivate EEB to motivate uh, uh, race-based policy. Um, is, that, is that being used by politicians to, to find excuses for their own failures? Failures specifically in the public sector that have been letting down South Africans so hard? The majority say yes, including the majority of Black South Africans. So there's a little sort of understanding of, of, of um, public opinion about this. And here's a little bit of an understanding of what the big problem is. The big problem is that unemployment uh, while it was, um, uh, 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 we had the unemployment rate coming down in this period, very important period, from 2003 to 2008. Unemployment comes down substantially 
from over 40% to 29.5%. This was a good period, as it happens before BEE was being fully implemented. And we see, for various reasons to do with the global financial crisis, commodity super cycles, and so on, we see unemployment starting to climb again. And unfortunately, we see this terrible plateau followed by an increase towards the end of the 20 teens. And it looks even harsher if you look at this in terms of the number of people that are unemployed. On the official definition, that is climbing through 4 million and, beg your pardon, I just have to move this, climbing up to, to, to 7.5 million. And if you look at the number on the expanded definition, and this means people who aren't in work and who've also given up on looking for work, these are people who are still looking for work. This extra is that people who, who aren't even looking for work anymore. You see a massive increase climbing up to 12 and a half million unemployed South Africans in uh, Q3 2021. And we don't have a lot of reason to expect that those numbers are going to improve much as Stats, Stats SA releases the latest date. And in fact, we've seen um, a disruption in that Stats SA data gathering. Uh, but that's a topic for another day. The point is these numbers have to be looked at. This is the biggest problem most people identify in South Africa uh, as what government needs to address. And, and I think that anger is in a way what is being channeled into EEB. But EEB is not going to solve the problem. It's only going to make it worse. Um, we have been discussing things with the, with the policy side, with the economic side, and the hard prediction that we're making is that unemployment will go through the 50% barrier um, on the expanded definition uh, with EEB implementation. We're currently at 46%. It's going to break through the 50% ceiling. That is going to make us uh, basically a world record um, unemployment uh, 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 country. Uh, it's really almost impossible. In fact, I think it is impossible to find a country with such high unemployment that also has um, uh, the, the, the sort of constitutional democracy that, that we live under. Um, now, there are three basic reasons for this, for, this, for this hard prediction. The first is the most obvious, uh, that jobs depend on mixing capital with labor. Uh, when, you're, when you're a builder, you need the bricks to build with. Um, and those bricks, it takes money to have those bricks. It makes, takes money to have the factories going. It takes money to have the petrol or gas or diesel needed to move the goods back and forth. And that requires investment for that money. And that investment gets chased away by this policy for the simple reason that uh, investors are looking for return on investment, whereas this policy is looking uh, to, to, to really irrelevant qualities about how people look um, and that that just doesn't make for a good investment environment we've already seen this um, under the BEE regime we've seen um, a massive outflow of both foreign and domestic investment and uh, and 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 that's and that's going to be significantly worse under the EEB provisions because they are significantly more stringent the second basic reason is that this is going to drive state capture 2.0. Um, and in this regard, I really want to refer you to, to the analysis of state capture 1.0, to what's often called the Zondo report. Um, and, and, and the finding there was that in the public sector, so much of the reason that things, um, that things went as badly as they did is because of our race laws. One of the reasons that they, that they make things go badly is that when you've got this tension in procurement between finding the cheapest uh, uh, price for the same goods, and you've got another incentive, which is to go and find um, a seller who happens to look a certain way, this creates a confusion. And so some procuring officers will end up uh, breaking the law because the law says two things must come first, which is impossible to achieve, best value for money and uh, best transformation targeting. If you're, asking, if you're being asked to put two things first that are, as the report says, inevitably going to be in tension sometimes, then there is no 
uh, logical thing to do. And then you can make it up as you go. Some people are going to do their best, but some people are going to take advantage of that confusion and uh, uh, fund uh, crony capitalist enterprises uh, costing the taxpayer. That's exactly what he found to have happened. And, and that's going to be much worse because of the pre-disqualification criteria being reintroduced by the EEB. The third reason is that service delivery is going to continue to dilapidate. The more we focus on we distract from, from, from the basic failures in service delivery, the longer it takes for accountability to, to move from a slogan to an actual implementate, implemented idea, the more we see um, service providers and especially manufacturers, uh, farmers and so on, be unable to get their goods to market, need to move those, uh, those dairies uh, across the country, uh, need to shut down those refineries, why? Because at some level, it's just the case that the roads are not working. The electricity is not coming in. The water is polluted and unsanitary. And, and it's, just, it's just not possible to get the work done. So the business is shut down and the jobs continue to be shed. Okay, I'd like to just conclude this um, with a quote from the Zondo Commission report, which really speaks to to the intractable problems uh, that South Africa faces, as long as its laws continue to have this tension between two projects, the one project being getting the best value for money for South Africans, no matter how we look, getting the best merit in the job, uh, no matter how we look. And on the other hand, this idea of, of trying to treat people like, um, like, like uh, dollops of paint on a palette that need to be sort of mixed together and painted by number to, to, to get everyone in, the, in their place. Uh, there, are, there is this tension in our law and, and, and the Zona Commission said, the failure to identify the primary intention of the constitution is unhelpful. And it has negative repercussions when this delicate and complex choice, and the choices between those two things has to be made by default by the procuring official. Ultimately, in the view of the commission, the primary national interest is best served when the government derives the maximum value for money in the procurement process and procurement officials should be so advised. Unfortunately, we're going in the opposite direction and that is sure to drive unemployment above 50%. Anthea, back over to you. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, as we've said, the whole purpose of, of this media briefing, apart from setting out the facts that you've been informing us about, is to consider why the President Cyril Ramaphosa should veto this EE bill. And the answer really lies in the Constitution itself, because he has an obligation under Section 79 of the Constitution, if we could just move to that, because it says that he must he may not sign a bill into law if he has reservations about its constitutionality. So all the important points that we've been making about how ordinary citizens view employment, action, employment equity and BEE and all the negative economic ramifications are not sufficient for the president to veto a bill. But what is sufficient is if he has reservations about its constitutionality then he must refer it back to the National Assembly for reconsideration. And there's no doubt but that the EE Amendment Bill conflicts with many provisions in the Constitution, and I can only deal with some of them. If we start with Section 1, this is one of the founding provisions in the Constitution, and it lists non-racialism as a founding value with which all legislation must comply. And yet the EEB is a law that will require race classification and will also require that racial preferences be extended from where they are now. And the NC really likes to pretend that we can defer the obligation to uphold non-racialism until such time as demographic representativity has been reached. But that's not so. The obligation to uphold non-racialism is immediate and it can't be deferred. 
until demographic representation 50 has been reached. So it's, it's not as if in 10 or 20 or 50 years time then, we have an obligation to be non-racial. We have that obligation right now. Secondly, section nine says that everyone is equal before the law. And it also prohibits unfair discrimination by both the state and the private sector on the grounds of race and on a whole number of other listed grounds. In addition, section 9.5 states that discrimination on a listed ground such as race is unfair unless the contrary is shown. In other words, it's presumed to be unfair and the discriminator must then rebut that presumption. We also have in section 9.2 an authorization for affirmative action measures which help those disadvantaged by unfair discrimination. And that, of course, is the basis on which many people have assumed that the Employment Equity Act and now the bill itself, which is tightening up the act, are saved from in constitutional invalidity by the provisions of Section 9.2. But that disregards the key test that was laid down by the Constitutional Court in the Van Heerden case. And that's what I'd like to turn to now. The Van Heerden case was decided in 2004 by the Constitutional Court in a judgment handed down by J Judge Dichang Masaneka. And it said in essence that affirmative action measures cannot be presumed to be unfair, despite the wording in section 9.5 of the Constitution, because, and I quote, they are authorized remedial measures. But the court also said that there are tests to be applied in considering their validity. And those three tests are, first, do they target the disadvantaged? Secondly, do they advance the disadvantaged? And thirdly, do they promote the achievement of equality? So any affirmative action measure has to meet those three criteria if it is to be valid under the Van Heerden judgment. And yet we find that neither the courts nor many other commentators ever apply those three tests to employment equity, see what the outcomes have been, see whether the criteria are met. And that is something which we need to do. So if we start with the first of the Van Heerden tests, that requires the targeting of the disadvantaged but most beneficiaries of the bill, as with the Employment Equity Act itself, will not be the disadvantaged, but the relative elite, the roughly 15% of black people with the best skills and or the best political connections. And unfortunately, the beneficiaries will not be the remaining 85% of black people, many of whom are unemployed and poorly skilled. The great majority of black people simply have no realistic prospect of ever benefiting from the management and other senior posts under the bill. We have effectively a bait and switch policy being applied. This wording comes from Thomas Sowell, who works at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, has been a strong criticism of affirmative action in the US for many years. And he says that what happens when a new law is being brought, that lawmakers will draw the attention to the plight of the underclass, the black underclass in America, and will then say that this new bill will benefit them. But that's not what happens when the new bill is implemented. It's the middle class, it's the most advantaged within the disadvantaged group that take the benefit of it. So effectively a bait and switch policy from the plight of the poor to the benefit to the better off. And this is also the case in affirmative action policies pretty much right around the world, wherever they are based on race or ethnicity, rather than on socioeconomic status, it's always the most advantaged within the disadvantaged group that is able to draw the benefit, what India calls the creamy layer. If we turn to the second Van Heerden test, advancing the disadvantaged, is that's what's happening with employment equity. If we look at the record, Rapid Employment Equity Implementation in the Public Service and State-Owned Enterprises, or SOEs, has brought about a crippling loss of experience, skills, and institutional memory. And it has also opened the way 
to what the Zondo Commission has spent quite a lot of time talking about in its reports, the widespread use of cadre deployment. This is the appointment of ANC loyalists who have few skills and little accountability because they answer to the deployment committees which have given them their posts, not the employers and managers to whom they are formally supposed to answer. And the upshot has been the major delivery failures not common right across the public sector. And I won't elaborate, but just provide a few examples. In schooling, we have again schools in the Eastern Cape which haven't yet received their textbooks and a court case being implemented to try and rectify this. In healthcare, we have so often medicines which are sitting in a central depot but not being delivered to the clinics where they're needed. In housing, we have so often a period of three to 10 years before we shift from land to stand. In other words, we get to the point where land has been given all the necessary permits and the bulk infrastructure and a housing project can proceed. With water, we have the dreadful situation where wastewater plants are no longer properly maintained. And so raw sewage is spewing into the rivers and, rivers and dams of the country at an extraordinary rate, most notably recently in the Vol. Uh, sanitation, you have new pipes put in, there's a great deal of excitement in communities, and then the pipes crumble and they don't work anymore. With electricity, we're all aware of the poor maintenance at so many of our power stations and hence the rolling blackouts. With infrastructure, worth remembering what Trevor Manuel, of, uh, one of our earlier finance ministers said a number of years ago, that we just can't get projects off the ground. And so every year there are big infrastructure numbers in the, the government's budget. And every year, much of that money just gets rolled over to the next because projects haven't happened on the ground because of a lack of skills. And we also know that an inefficient public service has restricted investment and hence growth and jobs. The South African economy makes up about 0.4% of the world economy. So potential investors have many other choices before them. And they're aware of the enormous inefficiency in the public service here. We have reams of red tape, but the red tape works very badly. So there's good reason for investors to go elsewhere. And that means that we lose out on growth and we lose out on employment and we get to the sort of figures that Gabriel was showing earlier. So we haven't been advancing the disadvantage. We've in fact entrenched disadvantage through employment equity. We haven't helped black people to get ahead. We look at the third of the fun here tests. What about promoting the achievement of equality? And here we can see that the figures don't look good. Income inequality on, on the Gini coefficient has worsened. It was about 59 in 1994, but it's gone up to 67, according to the latest World Bank figures. And the reason, according to the South African Communist Party, for this widening inequality is mainly because we have so much greater inequality within the Black population, which of course, since it makes up more than 80% of the total population, has a huge impact on our overall inequality figures. So widening inequality within the black side of the population means really badly widening inequality everywhere. And employment equity has helped to widen that gap. gap. We have 15% of black people who've done well or relatively well, and 85% have been harmed by the failing public service, by limited growth in jobs, and we now have 11 million black people roughly who are unemployed and destitute. So great wealth among the few and enormous destitution among the many. And that is what EE has helped to bring about. In addition, just to remind you of the statistics that Gabriel put up on the, board, on, on the screen earlier, the bottom 40% of blacks have seen no increase in their share of national income which was 3.7% in 2015 and 3.4% in 2006. So over that period when BE rules were sharply ratcheted up, the bottom 40% saw no benefit and it was only the top groups within the black population that saw an advance. The preferential procurement rules are unconstitutional too. And just to remind you what those rules say, Firms that don't comply with racial targets will be barred from contracting with the state, leaving the field open for BEE tenderpreneurs 
around 50% of state procurement, which is worth more than 1 trillion rand at the moment, is tainted by inflated prices and fraud, as the Treasury's chief procurement officers have indicated. This warning was first sounded in 2016 by the then chief procurement officer, Kenneth Brown, who said the percentage was between 30 and 40%. But in 2018, when the acting chief procurement officer, Willy Matapole, came before the Zondo Commission as its very first uh, provider of evidence, he said that at least 50% of the state's procurement was tainted in this way, and that the kind of price inflation that happened was enormous. Once some excuse had been found to bypass normal procurement rules, then a contract that was sitting at 4 million rand soon went up to 200 million. What we have is a rule that limits price inflation. It's supposed to be restricted to 10% on contracts that are worth more than 50 million rand and 20% on contracts below 50 million under the Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act or the PPPFA. That basically applies a point system. You can get 10 points for BEE status on those contracts above 50 million um, and 90 points for price. And you can get 20 points for BEE status and 80 for price if the contract is worth less than 50 million. And in rough terms, what that means is you can charge 10% more on a big contract and still win it if your BEE status is correct. But there's supposed to be a constraint on how far price inflation can go. What happens in practice is something very different. The markups are often 100% or more. Bravan Gordon lamented the fact that the government was commonly paying 40 million rand for a school instead of the 15 million rand that should have applied. Gwedi Mantashe has talked about how the state is paying 27 rand for a bottle of water instead of seven rand, and that this is, is a form of waste that should end. And we had William Matabule warning that contracts can go from 4 million to 200 million once the normal rules have been in some way bypassed. So what we see <clears throat> so is that the markups are needed to pay bribes to officials and politicians, and they also use to keep greasing the ANC's patronage machine. That's why many B businessmen have said it's actually difficult not to inflate prices. Yet often the goods and services provided are defective or deficient. In the housing context, for example, you'll find RDP houses that crumble, or you'll find that only 10 or 20% of the total that was promised has in fact been delivered at all. We also know that this is a major additional reason, this flawed procurement, for the failures of the public service and the SOEs. It's only after the bribes and the inefficiencies have been factored in that what's left over can be used for schools, medicines, houses, and all the other things that are so badly needed. Because, of course, the people who suffer the most are the poor black majority. They cannot afford to buy from the private sector, and so they have to rely on what the state provides. And the BE, the bills, procurement bills, let me say that again, the bill's procurement rules clearly fail the Van Heerden tests. They're going to target the relative elite, not the great majority. They will further harm the great majority by making procurement even more wasteful than it already is. And they will widen inequality but within the black population, once again, between the few who do well and the many who suffer even more. This is clearly against section 217 of the constitution, which requires, as Gabriel was saying, that all state procurement has to be fair, transparent, and cost-effective. State entities may nevertheless apply preferences which meet the Van Heerden tests, provided that they also comply with the framework which has been set out in national legislation. And that framework is the PPPFA. It is the framework statute, which is required by section 217. And it, as we were talking about, allows limited price inflation on state contracts, 10% on contracts worth 50 million or more, and 20% on those worth less. But the PPPFA does not allow firms to be excluded from tenders altogether 
because they have failed to meet employment equity racial targets. And so what we see is that the current system, what is being proposed in the bill is quite clearly unconstitutional. The bill sets pre-qualification criteria. If you don't meet the right EEE management quotas, you won't be allowed to participate in state tenders. And yet the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court have recently struck down similar pre-qualification criteria that were introduced in 2017 under the PPPFA regulations. In essence, what those two courts have said is that the PPPFA applies a point system to everyone, not exclusions to some, and pre-qualification criteria are all about excluding some so that their bids can't be considered at all. Just to make a couple more points, the solution lies, as Gabriel was saying, in a non-racial system of economic empowerment for the disadvantaged or EED. EED would give business points for all their important economic contributions, for the investments that they make, for the jobs that they sustain or better still create, for the tax revenues that they contribute to the fiscus to be used in education and housing and so on, for the innovations that they achieve, which help improve the efficiency of the economy. All these things which are actually vital in turning the country into a vibrant growing one, where there is real scope for upward mobility. At the same time, we need real help for the poorest by our tax funded vouchers for schooling, housing and healthcare. Just to look at schooling for a minute, low income households would then receive tax funded vouchers which would give them the possibility of choosing what school they want their child to go to. And all the schools in the vicinity would have to compete for their custom. And having to compete for their custom would mean those schools would have to keep their efficiency up and their prices down. And it would be an enormously beneficial in changing the quality of schooling from what we have now, very low quality, to what we could have, vibrant and effective. The last point I'd like to deal just, just looking a little bit back to the past, because there may be some people who feel that if we change the system, that if we look to benefit really the people who are the most disadvantaged, that this might be bad news for the black middle class or those who have had the benefit of good schooling already, and who have heard the ANC saying for years that it's only because of employment equity and BEE that they have any opportunities available to them at all. The ANC likes to pretend that it's their race-based laws which open up opportunities for Black people and that they would languish in the most dire poverty without those race-based laws. So let's look back at what history shows. And it shows that the white population was too small to meet the needs of the economy after a decade of rapid growth in the 1960s. So throughout that period, white business was saying to the National Party government, please lift the restrictions on Black advancement. And in 1973, John Forster, then Prime Minister, finally yielded to that pressure and said he would no longer stand in the way of Blacks moving up into more senior jobs. And so a process of major Black advancement began then, obviously off a low base, but it persisted very strongly and was important and effective. And after 1994, business had even more reason to want to fast track the appointment of black people into senior posts in business, which was why in 1997, when the Employment Equity Bill was first mooted, um, a consultancy called FSA Contact, which monitored uh, what was happening in 150 firms, reported that 90% of them had affirmative action programs in place, that 60% of them experienced the poaching of their skilled black employees. In other words, they were having to pay premiums above normal salaries in order to attract black people into senior jobs. And then they would find that they were poached again by the next business, which was willing to offer them even more. In other words, there was a huge unmet demand for skilled black people. Uh, it wasn't that there was a racist refusal on the part of business to employ them. And it was clear that if you had a rapidly growing economy and very much better education for everyone, then you would have an organic expansion of employment in which Blacks would participate and get the benefit just as much as whites, if not more, because whites have been too small a group to meet the needs of the economy.
since the early 1970s, and black skills were absolutely required for the economy to grow. And that's the reality. So if we could get through EED to a rapidly growing economy and good schooling for everyone, then we could see an expansion in upward mobility that would be quite stunning, far better than anything we've ever seen before, and which would reach right down to the grassroots as well as helping the people who are already better off. Thank you. Thank you, Anthea, over to you, Chris. Thanks very much, uh, Anthea and Gabriel. I think an excellent discussion and presentation on what the EEB holds for South Africa were it to become law. Uh, we have at least one question from the audience and I have a few more from my side. We have about seven minutes left, so we'll try to cover those as well as we can. So our question is from Nicholas Lorimer. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, you mentioned that the minister will be able to demand answers for failures to meet employment goals, the minister presumably having the ability to reject or accept these answers. Would this open the door for corruption by allowing companies on good terms with the ministers to avoid these requirements whilst providing the minister with a tool to punish companies who do not tow government's line? I think, Anthea, maybe you should tackle that one. <laughs> Well, it makes me think of what Jane, John Cain Berman has often said about the apartheid era and the labor inspectors who did come um, before the rules began to be relaxed. Um, and all the employees who had the bottle of whiskey ready for the labor inspector <laughs> so that he would turn a blind eye. So perhaps there's still a bottle of whiskey in offices so that the new labor inspectors will turn a blind eye. Um, certainly well, there's, 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 there's always paper, going to sorry. be... <laughs> maybe more than whiskey. There's always going to be an incentive towards corruption when rules uh, cannot easily be complied with, when the rules are unreasonable, when you can't run a sensible business with full compliance with what the government expects you to do. Many people will be tempted to try and find a way around it. Thank you. Uh, to Gabriel, I have a question around your mention of the black bottom 40%. So if the EEB is not the kind of policy that is needed to, to move at least some people who find themselves in that bracket because of the wrong policies, if the EEB is not the answer, what alternatives and ideas do you, do you have in mind that could rather be implemented, that, that could focus more on wealth creation and not just patronage and redistribution? Thank you, Chris. Um, I do think that South Africa's political emphasis on redistribution uh, as a way to help the poor really is very, very unfortunate. Um, in the same way that Anthea was saying, the white population is just too small to be able to satisfy the need for skilled labor that South Africa has. It's also the case that South Africa's asset base is just too small to re be redistributed uh, in a way that would satisfy the needs of poor South Africans. Um, I think one nice thing to look at is the ratio between our asset base. In other words, adding up all of the assets in South Africa, public and private, netting them of debt. What is the value of South Africa Inc? Um, as the late IRR economist Ian Cruikshanks would describe it, South Africa Inc. Uh, what's its asset value and what's its annual income? How much, how much value add is being generated every year through that? What is GDP effectively? Um, and that ratio in South Africa is extraordinarily low. Um, it's one of the lowest in the world, um, and it's been flat uh, basically since the 2000s. In fact, it's been decreasing as with the capital flight uh, that, that we were talking about. So because the asset base is so low, you, you can't redistribute. What you really need to do is mix those assets with labor in a way that's going to create more value, uh, where people are tapping into that. Uh, by, by adding value and getting um, a revenue from it. Uh, this is just restating the question, I guess, uh, to get to the answer. How do you do that? Well, one thing you need to do is to protect the value of assets. Uh, it turns out that one of the greatest sources of value in, in any asset is, is the right in property that the owner has over that asset. Uh, if, if you can... If your bicycle can be robbed, uh, you can't very well plan to have a newspaper service delivery uh, small business in your neighborhood as a teenager looking to make some pocket money using that bicycle. Um, 
you need to be able to keep the bicycle. So we need to strengthen property rights. Uh, in part, that means turning away from the expropriation bill, which continues to try to achieve expropriation without compensation. In part, that means dealing with crime and corruption. Uh, and in part, that means turning away from this discretionary and race-based legal framework that we have, which is open to bribery, which is open to all kinds of malfeasance. In part, it means rolling out title deeds to those 17 million, roughly 18 million South Africans living on government land, privatize all of that. There are various steps like that that need to be taken. Um, but I think for the long run, uh, there just is nothing like better education for the job that we're looking for. And that's why I think one of the most important questions we have there is, you know, firstly, how would you like to improve the education system? 70% plus, say, through a voucher system that gets them out of the clutches of SATU, out of the clutches of a sort of race-obsessed curriculum-changing system and into a position where parents can make their own choice. And then secondly, do you personally think you would benefit more from a system like that, a voucher-based system, than from BEE? Over 70% say yes. We would benefit much more from a system like that than from BEE. I happen to think that the, that the wisdom of crowds is, is a relevant term here. I think most South Africans have it exactly right. Uh, that is the way forward in the long run. I think with one minute left, that is an excellent note on which to end as much as we we find and it's very important for us at the rr to help communicate the potential negative effects of these bills we also very much want to focus on alternatives and solutions and i think what gabriel has said there is a great note on which to leave all of you so to our our two uh, speakers gabriel and dr jeffrey thank you very much for your time this morning your expertise invaluable as always and to those in attendance thank you for your time this morning we hope you found it insightful and useful and we'll be in touch with you soon with more materials right after the event. Until next time, take care.